Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. You know, it's amazing to think that even something as simple as a metal sphere can store electrical energy. It really is, and you know what's even more fascinating? This isn't just limited to small objects. Oh. Even planet Earth, just think about that for a second. Even planet Earth exhibits capacitance. So it's like Earth is one giant. Exactly, like a giant ball that can hold electrical charge. That's mind blowing. So today, let's break it all down. Capacitance. We'll explore how it works, what affects it. And why it matters, especially for all you tech enthusiasts out there. That's right, we are your AI experts here to make these complex topics easy to understand. Absolutely, so first things first. Yeah. What is capacitance? Okay, so when I hear capacitance, I immediately think of those tiny little components, capacitors. Right. But it sounds like capacitance is a much broader concept. You're absolutely right. Capacitance is the ability of an object to store electric charge. Okay. And it's measured in farads, named after the brilliant Michael Faraday. Nice. The more charge an object can hold at a given voltage, uh -huh. the higher its capacitance. All right, so voltage is like the electrical pressure. Yes and charge is the amount of electricity itself. Exactly. Okay. Think of it like a water tank. Okay. The tank's size, that's like capacitance. Got it. The water pressure, that's like voltage. And uh -huh. the amount of water stored, well, that's the charge. So a bigger tank, more water at a given pressure. Right. Just like an object with higher capacitance. Yes. More charge at a given voltage. Exactly. That's a great analogy. It is. But how does this actually work? How does an object even store charge? Like what's going on at the microscopic level? It all boils down to the interaction of electric charges. In a typical capacitor, you have two conductive plates uh -huh. and they're separated by an insulator called a dielectric. So like two metal plates with some non-conductive material between them. Exactly. When you apply a voltage across these plates, yeah. electrons, which carry a negative charge, they accumulate on one plate right. and this creates an electric field yeah. that influences the other plate causing positive charges to gather there. So they're attracted to each other because they have opposite charges. Exactly. And since opposite charges attract, yeah. they basically hold each other in place. So the electrons aren't actually flowing through the dielectric. No, they can't pass through the insulator. Okay. It's more like the electric field created by the electrons on one plate is influencing the other plate. Gotcha. And the separation of charges, this is how energy is stored in a capacitor. Ah, uh, that makes sense. So it's this buildup of opposite charges held apart by that dielectric yes. that gives the capacitor its ability to store energy. Precisely. Now, is that similar to how a battery works? Well, both store energy, right? but the way they do it is quite different. Batteries store energy chemically through chemical reactions. Okay. Capacitors, on the other hand, they store energy electrostatically. So like a stretched rubber band. Exactly. Ready to snap back. I see, so it's more like a temporary storage. Yes, ready to release that energy quickly when needed. Now we've been talking about capacitors. Right. But you mentioned earlier that even isolated objects have capacitance. Yes. Can you expand on that a bit? Absolutely, that's called self-capacitance. Any object, even if it's all alone, can store a small amount of charge. Hmm. Interesting. Remember our Van de Graaff generator example? Yeah. That big metal sphere at the top? Uh, that has self-capacitance. Wow. So even a single object can act like a mini capacitor. Exactly. Just by virtue of its shape and its relationship to its surroundings. And you said the Earth itself has self-capacitance. That's right. It's like one massive sphere capable of storing a huge amount of charge. Incredible. It is. Okay. So we've got self-capacitance for individual objects. Right. And then the capacitance we talked about with capacitor. Yes. The two plate, is there a specific term for that? That's called mutual capacitance. It refers to the capacitance between two conductors, like the plates in a capacitor. Gotcha. And the distance between those plates, that plays a big role in determining the overall capacitance. So the closer the plates are, the higher the capacitance. You got it. Think back to our water tank analogy. Okay. Two tanks with the same volume, but one has a wider base and shorter walls. Yeah. The other has a narrower base and taller walls. Yeah. Which one would hold water under greater pressure? The one with the shorter walls, the water's more packed mm -hmm. in. Exactly. Mm. Same principle applies to capacitors. Okay. Closer the plates, the stronger the electric field between them, and the higher the capacitance. Makes sense. And what about the size of the plates? Does that matter too? Absolutely. Larger plates, more surface area for charges to accumulate. So bigger plates, higher capacitance. It's just like having a bigger tank to store more water. Okay, 
So we've got plate size and distance, right. anything else that affects mutual capacitance. Mm. What about the material between the plates, the dielectric? That's a great question. The type of dielectric is super important. Different materials have different abilities to support electric fields. We call this property permittivity. Permittivity. And a dielectric with higher permittivity can actually increase the capacitance. So even with the same plate size and distance, changing the dielectric can change the capacitance. Exactly. That's why engineers have to carefully choose dielectric materials. Interesting. I'm really starting to appreciate just how sophisticated even a tiny component like a capacitor can be. They really are. And there's still so much more to uncover. I bet. But I think we should probably take a little break. Yeah, sounds good. When we come back, we'll dive into energy storage. Awesome. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about how capacitors store energy. Yes. Like tiny electrical springs. Exactly. And that stored energy is what makes capacitors so unique. Oh, so? They can deliver these bursts of power way faster than a battery ever could. Remember that equation, W equals one half CV squared. Well, that tells us how much energy a capacitor can store. Remind me what each of those letters stands for again. Sure, so W, that's the energy, uh -huh. C is the capacitance, uh -huh. and V is the voltage. Got it. So higher capacitance and voltage, more energy packed into that tiny component. So it's like, if you have a big capacitor, charge it up to a high voltage. You've got a ton of potential energy just waiting to be unleashed. Exactly. And this ability to store and rapidly release energy. Yeah. That's what makes capacitors so useful in electronics. Like what? Think about a camera flash. You need that sudden burst of power to light up a scene. Right. A capacitor can deliver that way more efficiently than a battery could. So capacitors, great for those quick bursts of energy. Exactly. But what other cool things can they do? Well, capacitors are crucial in all sorts of circuits. Okay, like what? For example, filtering, smoothing out voltage fluctuations. Uh, to ensure a stable power supply to your devices. Oh, that's important. It is. So they're like tiny reservoirs, yeah. just smoothing out any bumps in the electrical flow. Great analogy. And they're also vital in timing circuit. Timing circuit. Yeah, controlling the precise timing of operations within a circuit. Wow, so they're really important for making sure everything runs smoothly. They are. And of course, their role in energy storage. Yes. Providing backup power. Right. Enabling devices to charge and discharge quickly. All thanks to capacitance. Wow. So capacitance isn't just this theoretical concept. No. Nope. It's actually what makes our electronics work. It's amazing to think about. It is. And as technology keeps advancing, yeah. understanding and controlling capacitance, it just becomes more and more critical. This has been super interesting. It has. But I have to admit, my brain is getting a little full. I hear you. We've covered so much. We have. Self-capacitance, mutual capacitance, energy storage. Right. Now I'm wondering, are there any downsides to capacitance? That's a great question. And it brings us to stray capacitance. It's basically unintended capacitance. Unintended. Yeah, it can happen between any two conductors that are close together. Hmm, so like an unwanted guest at the capacitance party. You could say that. Imagine you've got two wires running close to each other in a circuit. Yeah. They can actually form a tiny unintentional capacitor. Oh, wow. And at high frequencies, this stray capacitance can cause signals to leak between those circuits. Oh, that sounds bad. It can be. So it's like having these phantom capacitors popping up everywhere, messing things up. Exactly. And as you can imagine, yeah. this can be a real pain for engineers, especially when they're designing high-speed circuits. They've got to be super careful then. They do. They have to get clever about minimizing the stray capacitance to make sure everything works properly. I think we've covered a lot of ground today. You know, we've explored the fundamentals of capacitance, from its definition and units to its role in circuits and all of its different applications. And, you know, we've even touched upon its limitations. I really hope our viewers have learned a lot and are just as fascinated by this concept as I am. I hope so, too. And remember, you know, if you have any questions or you want to explore specific aspects of capacitance further, just, well, feel free to leave a comment below. We love interacting with our viewers and answering your questions. Yeah. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss our next video on inductance. Yeah, we can't wait to delve into those mysteries of magnetic fields and coils with you then. And until then, keep exploring. We'll see you in the next video.